Hi guys, so teaching and learning strategies, the, uh, the final piece of the jigsaw if you like. Um, if we get our lesson planning and our teaching and learning strategies correct, then the risk management is actually taken care of because this is, this is what it's all about really. If, if we're matching um, the size of step that we're taking with the learner and we're making sure that it's suited to their, their abilities uh, and their needs, their goals, then the risk is actually taken care of. So this is the section of the form um, that you're marked on. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's uh, quite a lot more information on this one. So we'll look at them one by one. Um, the examiner guidance says that the important thing to remember when considering teaching and learning strategies or styles, um, it's not just about coaching. Uh, it's about client-centered learning, about putting the learner at the heart of everything. Um, our judgment should be, this is the examiner's, whether you, the ADI, can help the people learn in an active way, so that the learner is actively involved. Um, I'll do another video at some point in the future about about, about that, if you like. Um, but remember, instruction based around the core comps, as we use currently, um, isn't necessarily going to be thrown away. Uh, they still see that as pretty good. Um, what they're trying to do is to increase the options available to you. Um, coaching is a powerful extension of the range of options. It's not an automatic replacement, although if you get really good at it, it can be as long as we're managing it in small, easily manageable chunks. And their thinking is that as many times where it's useful to use a coaching technique, personally, I think coaching techniques work all the time. The principle that underpins the coaching though is that a learner who is engaged and in an active role uh, will achieve a higher level of understanding um, than somebody who is just told what to do. Uh, and that self-directed solutions or solutions defined for themselves uh, will seem more relevant and the long lasting. You only ever have to learn any lesson once because they never have trouble remembering it. Now that that applies in every situation, not just not just in coaching, but in everything. If you give some instruction and then you, you help the learner to reflect on it, then that will still also um, become a bit more permanent rather than being told. The direct instruction can be useful. Now they're saying it is useful. It can be useful to a pupil in the early stages if they're coping with new situations, if they can't find a way to do it themselves. Uh, or to support a people who's clearly struggling, or if you're suddenly surrounded by traffic, that kind of stuff. Um, and good coaching or good client-centered procedures, good teaching, if you like, will use the right method at the right time, uh, depending on what that pupil needs at that time in those circumstances on that day. Um, sometimes we need to give instruction. We need to take a, uh, control. And that, that's okay too. We shouldn't, we shouldn't worry about that. As long as we follow it up with, okay, this has happened. What have we learned from that? We use it as a learning trigger. Um, and it forms part of a coaching process if you then say, oh, okay, let's reflect on that. Tell me what you what you found out there. Tell me what you might do if you did that differently. Um, so what we're doing is they're looking to make sure that learning takes place. That's the key thing for them. Um, but if it's done in an active way, even better. So was the team... Oops. Was the teaching style suited to the pupil's style and current ability? What they're looking for you to do um, is to link learning in theory to learning in practice, to encourage and help the pupil to take, or the learner to take ownership of the learning process, what do they want to do, how do they want to do it, at a level that they're comfortable with, that you respond to any faults that are, that are there in a timely manner, so, you know, we're not waiting four miles until we pull over, that you provide enough uninterrupted time to practice new skills. Um, route planning comes into this as well. It's you want a short repetitive route, you don't want to do a roundabout, drive nine miles, do another roundabout. Um, and you provide the pupil with clear guidance about how they might practice away from the session. What they don't want from you is to adopt a style that's clearly at odds with the way that they learn best. Um, they want you to, or they want to be sure that you check with the pupil whether the approach that we're planning on using is acceptable. Um, what they don't want you to do is to not explore other ways of addressing a particular learning point. If we're struggling with something, try a different approach. Um, they want you to make sure that we're inv in inviting the pupil into the process at all times. They don't want to see you concentrate on delivering teaching tools rather than looking for learning outcomes. Um, what we tend to do is we have a bit of a bias. Um, the way we learn is our preferred method of teaching. So we've got to be careful that we don't do that. And they don't want you to ignore safety issues. Um, so basically, 
what we should be trying to do is build a good rapport with the learner and communicate effectively. Make sure everybody's on side with everything that's being agreed and, 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 and moving forward. Understand what it is that they want and where they currently are in their development. Help them re recognize suitable learning activities in line with their learning preferences, their current ability, their experience. So as part of the GROW process, which I'll, I'll talk about in another video, and this goal, reality, options, way forward. If they're choosing to do things that might compromise safety, we need to be jumping in there and saying, hang on a second, what about this? Have you considered this? When we did this exercise, we did it this way. That seemed to really work for you. Do you want to try that here? Um, and again, you're, 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 you're doing it in a way that helps them consider a variety of different ways of doing it because there is more than one way to do everything. Um, both inside the lesson are now, and did you let them focus on the learning process in hand without unnecessary interruptions? I mean, I'll give you a for example there. If you're you know, working on something new and something that can already do quite well gets a bit lumpy, um, don't be jumping in all the time. Oh, you've forgotten this, you've forgotten that. Come on, we need to do this. Let them focus on what it is that they're working on. Even if that means that you take care of that other part of the process and then once you've finished the new bit, bring it back in. And that would apply on standards check as well. You know, you could say, look, whilst we're doing this, I'll keep an eye on our safety. I'll let you focus just on this new bit. Um, and we want, we, they want to see you. Uh, and what we really should be striving for is to, to encourage the learner to take as much ownership of the process and the learning therein uh, wherever possible. The second one here, the next box that gets ticked, is was the pupil encouraged to analyze problems and take responsibility for their own learning? What the DVSA want from you, oops, uh, is to provide time um, in a suitable location to explore any problems or issues that came up during the lesson uh, or that were raised by the pupil or that were raised by something that happened. Um, you may have had to take control. Let's pull over and talk about that. Uh, what do you think that has, uh, how do you think that has an impact on what we're doing? Did you provide timely opportunities for analysis? Um, and in the case of something that was really quite serious or very high risk, almost immediately or as soon as it's humanly possible, did you take time uh, to, under to try and understand any problems the pupil had with understanding an issue? And you know, changing techniques if you, if you needed to, but other techniques you're using suitable to that learner. The only real way to find out um, is to ask. And if we get used to asking these questions uh, in our everyday working life, uh, then when it comes to, to the standards check, it becomes easy. If they can't come up with any ideas, did you suggest strategies? Well, uh, not saying here we're going to do this, but um, well, my learners sometimes find it useful to try this at this point. Or would you mind if I make a suggestion? Here's some things that you could try. So you're, you're sort of switching your instructor head to more of an advisor, if you like. Uh, did you give um, clear and accurate information to fill any gaps in their knowledge uh, or understanding? And did you make sure that they understood? And did you leave the people feeling that they had responsibility for their learning in this particular situation? That they had a part to play, they weren't just passive and sat listening to your pearls of wisdom? Um, oops. Get off. <laughs> Come on. What they don't want you to do um, is to leave the people feeling that you were in control of everything, um, that, that they had no part to play in it. They don't want you to fail to explore alternative ways of addressing problems, uh, and they don't want you to provide unsuitable or incorrect inputs. So it's, it's all about really providing opportunities for the learner to analyze problems in their performance in a suitable location in a timely manner. Um, now, sometimes that suitable location might end up being at home after the lesson because you didn't have time to get to it or, or whatever. So we, we must be talking about it during the lesson, but that's not the end of it. They can continue to think about it afterwards. Did you encourage the learner to come up with ideas on how best to solve problems and improve performance in, in pursuit of their goals? Did you help them recognize any risky choices um, that they might be about to make that might be inappropriate? Did you offer suggestions when they're struggling? And did you allow the opportunities for the learner to take on as much responsibility as was possible within the realms of safety um, for any activity. So small, easily manageable steps make that much, much easier. Uh, this is an interesting one. Were opportunities and examples used to clarify learning outcomes? What do they mean by that? Well, what they want you to do is to use examples identified on a lesson, something has happened, um, in a suitable way, at a suitable time, to confirm or reinforce understanding. 
So use things that have happened. If you see other people doing things uh, that we might be able to learn from, use those as examples. Failing that, um, maybe you could tell a little tale about something that you've happened or experience you've had or something that's happened at a lesson. What's their opinion on that? Um, did you explore different ways to use those examples to respond um, to differences in learning style? Um, so just keep keep moving the goalposts. Don't just do the same stuff all the time. Did you use examples that are in, within their range of experience and, and, and their ability to understand? Did you use language that was simple and not complex? Did you recognize that some people might be able to respond instantly while others might need to think about it? They might need to reflect when they get home and come back later. What they don't want you to do is to use examples that the people, it just goes over their head um, because they haven't understood it, you haven't explained it clearly, um, or they haven't got the experience to understand what you're talking about. Now, they don't want you to use complicated examples that the people doesn't have the ability to respond to um, or doesn't have the skill level to be able to understand it. Uh, they don't want you to fail to give the people time to think through the issues and come to their own conclusion. And they don't want you imposing an interpretation. Now, this is one of the key areas where we get messed up by using questions. We ask questions, and then we don't like the silence that follows. Um, once you've asked a question, be quiet. Make sure the next person that breaks the silence isn't you. Make sure it's the learner. So ask a question, give them a bit of time to think. You'll feel very, very uncomfortable to begin with. Um, but they're just thinking. That's what the silence is about. But what we tend to do is we ask supplemental questions um, to help clarify. And then if we feel the learner is struggling, we ask another question and try and guide them along the path. Just ask the question and then be quiet. The people will either say, I don't know, I don't understand the question, or they'll give a, a, a stab at the answer. Leave them to think. So what we're saying really is, did you use examples based on scenarios, actual situations or stories that that help to confirm or reinforce their understanding, to raise their awareness of any risk that might be, that appeal to a variety of different learning styles. Um, and just because they've used a particular learning style one day, it doesn't mean they're gonna stick with that the rest of their life. Um, and do we help transfer of learning? Have we made learning happen? Have we got the learning out, rather than trying to put the learning in? Uh, this one's, again, interesting. Was the technical information given comprehensive, appropriate, and accurate, and I'm told that Sometimes it isn't on standards check. What they want you to do is to give comprehensive information, not complex, just comprehensive, a full answer um, uh, or a full description where there's a, a recurring weakness in the pupil's driving, where these, these weaknesses keep coming up again and again and again. Again, I keep harping back to this, but if you're using small, easily manageable steps, the pupils never out of that depth and they never really struggle. Uh, they want you to engage the people and give opportunities to them to explore their understanding of, of well, what's going on. What sense can they make of, of uh, what they're being shown, what they're being told, or what they've discovered. They want you to give clear, timely, and technically accurate demonstrations or explanations where necessary. Um, they want you to check the pupils' understanding, and if necessary, um, redo it. But not the same way. If you've tried it once one way, it hasn't worked. That's, that's the Englishman abroad, isn't it? If, you, if somebody hasn't understood, we say it louder and slower. No, find a different way of explaining it. Find a different way to help the learner understand. Your job is not to explain clearly, if you like. It's to make sure that what you've explained has been understood. <laughs> Although explaining clearly will help, of course. And did you find a different way to demonstrate or explain if the people just still doesn't understand? Did you find, are you being creative? Are you trying your damnedest to get the learning out and not put the learning in? What they don't want from you is to provide enough information. Um, too late, too early in the learning process. It's unclear. People don't understand. Um, they don't want you to just plow on without checking that the people does understand. Um, and they, do, they want you to explore different ways of doing things um, or presenting information where the pupils not really understanding it. It's really important that we look at body language and the people's sort of demeanor uh, here to make sure that the, the words they're using match their body language. Because quite often they'll just say, oh yeah, because they feel a bit embarrassed about saying they don't understand. So we do need to check. We might need to check by asking a couple of questions just to verify. So what we're saying, basically, we should offer explanations and demonstrations that are accurate, are relevant to that pupil, to the situation that we're in. They're done in a timely manner, so not too early, not too late. Uh, don't get in the way of things happening. And do they help learning take place in a, in a way that involves the learner, in a client-centered way, if you like. 
was the pupil given appropriate and timely feedback during the session. Uh, so what they want is, are you giving them feedback? Now, I like to think of it more in terms of, has a conversation happened? Uh, because feedback, kind of giving feedback, makes it seem like there's only you can do that. It's a two-way process. There's a conversation happening all the time. Uh, did you provide feedback in response to questions they've asked? Questions that were thrown up by things that have happened? Did you seek appropriate opportunities to provide feedback that reinforced understanding or confirmed achievement of learning objectives? Best way to do that, you know, is to set up a short repetitive route and get used to regularly pull it over for a review. Not pull over in the convenient place on the left because that makes them think, oh, I'm going to get torn off, oh, I've got something wrong. Once they get used to this idea of a review, so we'll do a little repetitive loop, one loop round, stop, review. On this next loop, what do you want? How are we going to go about that? What level help do you want from me? And they'll start pulling up on their own and start the review on their own. Uh, okay, what have we learned from that? What do we want to do next thing? You've got the chance to then give feedback if it's necessary about what's going on. But remember that the human beings are really pretty slick, you know, we're pretty clever. They can work stuff out as long as we're providing them with the right support and the right size of step to take. Um, did you provide feedback uh, about, well, they're saying, Feedback about failure to achieve learning objectives. Now, that makes it sound like you've got to tell them what they've done right and what they've done wrong. Um, not at all. Um, ask the people what's happened there. How was that? What did you enjoy? What did you not enjoy? If you were going to do it again, would you do anything different? It's The attitude that seems to prevail sometimes is, that, well, how can the learner know if I haven't taught them? The reality is you don't need to teach them. They've got a lifetime of experience. They've been watching people drive. They're unbelievably smart and they can work stuff out. If you think the only way they can learn is by you filling them with all the knowledge you've got, you are really, really mistaken. Um, also, did we provide feedback? Has a conversation gone on that the pupil understands and can make sense of? And did you also, we've talked about just earlier about watching the pupil's body language. Keep an eye on yours. Does your body language reinforce what you're actually saying? What they don't want from you is to wait for ages before you tell them about it uh, so that the pupil can't remember it. Uh, did you provide feedback that overlooked a safety critical incident? If something's happened, mention it straight away. Write it down if you need to. And make sure you, at the earliest of opportunity you pull over in a safe, convenient place and discuss what happened. Um, they don't want you to continually provide feedback when you might be distracting them. Leave them to concentrate wherever possible and leave them to drive and, and, and be independent as much as possible. They don't want you to just plow on and assuming that the pupil understands. Um, and they don't want you to provide feedback that's irrelevant to what we're, do what we're dealing with. For example, commenting on the personal appearance or the personal appearance of people that's outside. Jibber jabber that has no space in a driving lesson. There's no space in a driving lesson for talking about your personal life, for talking about their personal life, really for talking about the footy last night. That's okay as part, part of a little social interaction to build rapport at the start of a lesson. But during a lesson, it's lesson. It's, it's not to do with what's, what's going on outside. Um, and if you think it is, you're wrong. <laughs> These people are paying good money for this. Um, and we also should seek feedback from them on our performance. What do I do that you like? Is there anything I do you don't like? And we should be happy to adjust. Uh, you shouldn't take it personally. Because um, we don't want to listen to something. That's not working for me. We just assume that people are stupid if they can't understand what we're saying. No, definitely not. So what we're saying basically is, we should answer, answer answer the learner's questions properly to their satisfaction. So you're ready to find out is, did that satisfactorily answer your question? We mustn't engage in a conversation, uh, or we should rather engage in a conversation that help them look to evaluate their performance and consider what the next steps might be. The more they get into this, the easier they find it to take the next steps and decide on the next steps themselves. Did you help them decide an appropriate course of action in pursuit of any of their goals? Notice there, help them decide, not tell them. Uh, did you provide feedback that helped the learner to assess their readiness? Not you assess, but them assess. Um, did you provide feedback that was reinforced by your body language? So it, it's really important that we get them to see the bigger picture. We get them to make as many of these decisions as possible. Now, you can't just flick a switch on the learner and change them from somebody who's been told what to do to somebody who thinks about what they want to do. Um, it's, a, it's a process that will take you a little while. Uh, we should try and get better at it every day. With the pupils' queries followed up and answered, well, what they want you to do 
is to readily respond in an open way to any queries that the pupil asks. Did you provide helpful answers uh, or did you direct them to suitable sources of information? If you can't ask, answer the question, did you own up to that? It's a very good question. Do you know what? I'll have to come back to you on that one. Uh, and did you actively check with them if their comments or body language suggest they might have, you know, that sometimes you can see they're not sure about what you're talking about. So their body language is suggesting that they might have a question they want to ask, but they're too scared to ask it. And did you encourage them to explore possible solutions for themselves? That's important. What they don't want from you is to just not hear it, just refuse to respond. Um, you know, if people ask you a question, you haven't got the answer, don't just pretend they haven't asked. And apparently that's seen a lot on standards check. They don't want you to provide inaccurate information. Don't make it up. Look it up, not make it up. Um, and they don't want you to avoid the question uh, or deny responsibility for answering it. Well, I took you to find that out. No. Um, so what we're saying is we should listen actively um, using all senses for any questions or concerns that the learner might, might have had or has. Uh, we should have the learner express what their concerns are. Um, we should make sure that we understand what the people are saying. So clarify. So if I've got this right, what you're saying is. Um, so can you just clarify what it is that you're asking me? I'm not 100% sure. Could you just expand on that? And people do. Did you help them to find their own answers uh, where that was appropriate? Quite often, you know, if they ask you a question, if you just look interested and say, oh, that's an interesting question. What do you think? Quite often they'll go, oh, well, I don't know. And this seems crazy. But when they say to you, I don't know, just say, well, if you did know, what is it you think you would say? And at least half of the time they'll answer. Um, I sometimes take that a little bit further. If they still don't know, I'll say, well, give us your best guess then. Because I want to find out what's happening inside the head of the learner so I can then help them better. Uh, I mean, don't pursue it ad nauseam because they'll get annoyed with you. Um, did you make sure that you have fully answered the question? And admit that you didn't have the answer if you didn't. Um, and make sure any follow-up action is acceptable to the learner. Um, did the trainer maintain an appropriate non-discriminatory manner throughout the session? This is an interesting one too and I hear some interesting ideas about what people think this is about. They want you to keep a respectful distance and not invade the people's personal space. The reality is there is a pane of glass between you and the learner which can only be broken in an emergency. You keep out of that space because it's not yours. Um, did you ask them how they wish to be addressed? Don't be over familiar by calling them by their first name. They not like it. They might not like it. My name is Bob. My, my real name is Robert. It says Robert on my driving license. I don't like being called Robert. There you go. There's some ammunition for you. So if somebody continually calls me Robert, it actually gets on my nerves. Um, now well, that might not be enough to make them stop having driving lessons with you. But if there's that and you're invading their personal space a little, and um, maybe sometimes the car's not as clean as it should be, sometimes you're a little bit late, they're off. And it's you that's caused it. Um, so you must ask them, how do you wish me to address you? And tell them how they may address you. Um, we should never be really getting involved. If somebody has a slight disability, um, we have to be careful about you know, engaging them in it. Unless it's causing you an issue, leave it. It's got nothing to do with you. Um, sure, we've got to be sure that if we do need to know, that we, we ask them, but we let them know why we need to know. Um, for example, if you know somebody's got a couple of fingers missing, how are we planning on doing? You know, you know, so that there's there's all manner of things with it that we might need to know. Lots of things we don't as well. Uh, never adopt an an inappropriate position. So they want you to make sure you're appropriate at all times. Not putting your arm across the back of the driver's seat. Um, and never use language about other road users. That's not uh, nice. We don't want to use derogatory language. Um, they want you to behave in a professional manner. What they don't want you to do is to invade somebody's personal space, and that's the other side of that pane of glass between you. They don't want you to touch the people, including trying to shake hands, because in some cultures that's not that's just not not done. Uh, unless it's necessary, of course, for safety reasons. You're going to make physical contact. If you have to put a 360 degree turn on the wheel, you're going to make contact somewhere. But of course, we let the learners know that from time to time it may be necessary for me. Blah blah blah. Um, they don't want you to use the first name unless they've said it's okay. And they don't want you to comment really on their or anybody else's personal attributes or appearance unless it has a di direct impact on their ability to drive safely. For example, shoes that are, you know, stilettos, they're no good. Um, and it also, 
It's about how we view other road users. It's no good you shouting abuse at other road users. Um, so we should create and maintain as equal a relationship with the learner as we possibly can. We're a 50-50 partnership moving forward. Better still, it's better if it's 90% them and 10% you. Until it comes time, of course, to use the dual controls or move the steering, then it's 100-0 in your favour. But we've got to get back to 50-50, or having, them having more control as quickly as we can. We must exhibit humility and respect. Um, yes, we're full of knowledge, but that doesn't mean you should be full of something else. Um, we really, really should be looking to help, to serve rather. See yourself as the, um, the role is that of the butler. Would my loud mind me making a suggestion? Not like, yeah, I'm telling you what I do. We must be very professional, um, avoid personal matters or potentially controversial sub subjects of no relevance to the lesson. What's happening at home? What's happening in your home? Football, politics, sex, religion? Definitely not. Wars? There's no place for it in a drive school car. Uh, and we should explore any physical difficulties or other needs that, that might be in the way of the learning process to try and find solutions. But we must do that in a user-friendly way. So make sure you're behaving in a professional manner so you're always putting the pupil at ease. If you have done something that stops that, apologize instantly and profusely. Uh, and try and work on never doing it again. And the final one, and possibly if you want to be client-centered, it's one of the biggest things you need to do. And yet it's the uh, the smallest amount of information they've given. So at the end of the session was the pupil encouraged to reflect on their own performance. This is important. It's not a debrief from you anymore. Uh, not if you want to be client-centered. Um, they want you to help the pupil reflect on their performance, not to tell them what they've done. And they want you to help the pupil discuss their thoughts and feelings in regard to the process that's gone on. Uh, what they don't want is you to give feedback based on your ideas of what happened, although they might want your input. Uh, and they don't want you to tell the people what the next session will be about without involving them. So what we're saying really is that we should help the learner reflect on their performance at appropriate points during the lesson. I mean, this is a genuine performance review. At the end of the lesson and in between lessons, did you help them to perform honest self-appraisals did you help that? They'll nearly always be harder on themselves than you would. Did we help the learner understand the impact of their actions on other road users? Did we help the learner to understand the impact of other road users on them? What they might do differently next time? And did we help them to develop a provisional plan for the next session based on today's session and previous sessions? Um, if we use things like um, scaling, scaling's okay because it gives you a snapshot of what's happening in the learner's head. But we must be super, super careful when the learner says, oh, I think that was a two. And we're thinking we would have graded it an eight. You can't then say, oh, that wasn't a two. That's, that's much better than a two. Because otherwise, why did you ask them in the first place? Um, and the other extreme, which is where they've just, you know, d let's say done a turn of the road. And you ask them, how was that? And they say, oh, it was a ten. And you're thinking it was a two. Um, you can't say, oh, no, it wasn't as good as that. You, you've just got to use it as a snapshot. And then say, if they say they've got a low number, say, well, okay, how do you get a higher number? If they're saying the number that's higher than you would perhaps give it, you just say, okay, can you consistently perform to that level? Oh, I don't know, but what would it take to consistently perform? So you're not challenging the number. And remember sometimes that if they've just done a turn in the road and they're marking it at 10, that's probably because they're thinking, well, nobody's dead. And I've got the other way around, so that's a 10. Uh, it really needs to be about you helping the learner to develop helping the learner learn how to learn and if we do that with our lesson planning and our teaching and learning strategies who are really effective at that we will cover everything in the middle section which is risk management and we don't even need to think about it so if you think in terms of if you want to develop along this this route think in terms of how can i help this learner learn whilst keeping them completely safe and helping them to review on their own progress and put their own plans together and that way you'll be client-centered you'll give the dvs area the want and you'll certainly give your learners everything they want and need. Um, you'll end up with a waiting list, and your price will end up going up. I hope you found this all interesting. Um, if you have, great. If you haven't, apologies for wasting your time. If you want to do practical training with me, the, the website will be on the uh, on the end. end of the, my email address is bobbyclientsandatlearning.co.uk. You can use the same thing if you've got any questions for me. If you want practical training, give me a shout. We'll see if we can fit you in. Thanks for listening.